So once again, the pros and cons of different financing models. We're going to go over the general financing models. There's subsets and hybrids of all of them. Um, if you have any specific questions, once again, we can ask the panel. If we think it's relevant for the entire group, we'll address it. If not, we'll address it one-on-one -on -one afterwards. Um, to introduce the panel, oh, you guys sat in the first row. Uh, Jay Powell, he's the CEO of the Powell Group. Uh, I'm not going to let each one of them do their own introduction. Uh, Louis, your vice president? Yeah, vice president of Hibernum, their game developer in Montreal, Drew Bortz. Bortz he is the uh, SVP of BizDev and acquisitions for Nexon. And Jason, and I don't even know what your title is, senior, uh, senior director of business development. So if each one of you guys can expand a little bit on what you guys do, let's keep it short so we can get into the meat of it. So yes, I'm Jay Powell, founder of the Powell Group, ironically enough. The, I've been in the business side of the games for 20 years now, and for the last seven since I founded the firm, we focus on the consulting on the business development and the licensing side of the industry. Like uh, Jeff said so eloquently, I'm a VP and Chief Marketing Officer of Hibernum, Louis René Auclair. Uh, my studio makes games in different formats, whether it's work for hire, licensing deal, co-development deals. So we focus on getting deals with major IPs and then making games for them. Uh, I've been in the industry for 19 years in different shape or forms, and this is my seventh year as one of Hibernum's owners. Good morning, everyone. Drew Bortz from Nexon. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Nexon, Nexon is a large Asian publisher developer based primarily in Japan and in Korea. Uh, historically, we are a Korean company, although we are public in Japan. We are still relatively growing new to the, uh, the Western markets, but we do PC console and mobile titles for the West as well. Jason Park from Perfect World. Similar to Nexon, where we also are an Asian company, we're headquartered in China. Um, our North American office is based out of Redwood Shores, and where we focus purely on PC and console games. Um, we've been in the we've set up shop in the North, in North America for almost a decade now, and um, have been doing quite well, uh, working on free to play online games. And uh, like I said, there's multiple different ways to fund different deals, and oddly was watching you guys speak, I realized with the three of you, I've gone through almost every single one of them <laughs> that we're, we're about to go through, that I've worked on almost every model with these three right here. Um, so their traditional model, really quickly in here, who in here owns a game developer or works at a game developer? Um, how many are mobile, how many are PC? How many are mobile? What about PC? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was, there's really only one model for VR right now, and that's yeah. Oculus. Oculus Financing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so traditionally the model has been, and this still seems to be, if you're an independent developer, you go to a publisher, here's my idea, I need $25 million to make it in two years, I need $2 million to make it in two years, can I have the money, let's negotiate it out, or, and then the developer will come back and say, thanks for putting all that work into building a prototype. Would you like to do our game based on your prototype? However, what do you guys see, where do you see this evolving? Jay and I just actually had this conversation, if you want to kick off on it, the traditional publisher-centric model. So the traditional publisher model was very popular for a long time because all the publishers had the money and they held the gateways to Walmart and Best Buy and everything like that. And then when Steam and all the distribution models came up, it fell off a little bit, but, you know, my firm tracks 450 publishers around the world, and so it has very much grown since then. The big difference is you can't go in with a design document anymore. You used to be able to go in and say, hey, I've got this great team, this game, and we want to do this. You have to have a playable demo these days. Um, but that's the big way that that particular model has changed. I mean, you're seeing a wider variance in funding, but the people that can fund those $2 million, $25 million games are that's a very small group these days. Louis? Yeah, I think you would be able to uh, sign a deal on a paper pitch four or five years ago and now I don't think it's uh, it's doable anymore and I think it's uh, it's linked to 
the level of risk that you see in the industry, right? So everybody jumped onto mobile five, six, seven, eight years ago and everybody wanted to do all the games. And now all of a sudden the budgets are going up, the budget to make the game, to market the game are going up. So the risks are much bigger. So they're no longer signing on paper pitch. You need to have a prototype. Sometimes you need to be all the way to alpha uh, before they sign. And if you're dealing yeah. with like Asian publisher and you want to go just like Asia market, you're probably going to have to need KPIs from a soft launch. So uh, the more riskier the project, the further down production you need to be to sign a deal. Speaking as an Asian publisher, uh, <laughs> I, 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 yes, Louis, Louis is correct. Um, we, when you want to take a game from the West to Asia, their traditional financing model is very different than our traditional financing model. Uh, it is highly, or it was at least, highly common in Asia for a developer to work for two or three years and basically have the game to a beta stage before approaching publishers. And then publishers would pay both uh, minimum guarantees that were recoupable and fi licensing fees that were non-recoupable against that game that the developer had worked on for two odd years and put all of their own money into. Uh, that model just really doesn't exist in the West. So oftentimes there's a tension when a Western developer says, great, I want to take my game to Asia because it's a massive market and there's a lot of potential there, all of which is true. Uh, and then the Asian publishers say, well, where's your game? What do you mean, where's my game? You need to pay me to make it. No, you need to make your game and then we can talk. So it's important to, when you talk about traditional models, to understand that there are various cuts at what traditional is. There's a geographic cut, there's a platform cut, uh, and then there, there's a, uh, an industry segment cut that needs to be thought about as you develop a plan for how to finance your game. Like what a lot, a lot of the other guys have um, already, already said, the traditional model has changed. Uh, we've done deals from you know, the paper pitches from before and a, a lot of times we've been burned as well too. It's um, what gets pitched on a, a PowerPoint deck and what gets developed is so different sometimes and the creative vision, it changes throughout the life cycle of the first you know, pre-production uh, few months or just the creative vision, just the creative director just has a change of mind. So it's difficult to put a lot of money up front on uh, just a pitch without actually seeing how it's actually gonna play out and then if it doesn't play out the way you want it, why would you even want the game anymore? So, um, so there's huge risk now. So I think a lot of publishers are being a little more savvy and a little more, um, a little more aggressive actually on, um, re on wanting uh, prototypes and actually uh, seeing that true vision uh, follow through. And Jason touched on a very key point there. When you're going out and starting to think about the financing, you have to remember that you're not special. Everybody can have a great idea. That's it's a great point. point. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, I'm done. My drop. Good morning. All right. <laughs> no, it, it, it is interesting what Jay just said, and I, I've worked with a lot of developers and help them prepare their pitches. And it gets as far down as when you name your file and you submit proposal, they receive time of day. And you're like, put your name in the proposal. <laughs> so when they open it up on their desktop, they know the name of your company and the name of the game. And what that underlines is you're not special at all. They've got 50 games sitting there. Why should they fund your game? I don't, that, that's really... <laughs> Go on. Harsh but true. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to burst anyone's bubble, but that, that's actually accurate. Why should they fund you? Um, and also, though, too, I want to correct Louie. People do still fund paper. Um, but you, you can go out there. You can get a... Um, 10, 20 million dollar game funded on pieces of paper, but your team better if ship hits. They better be the key people. And the single most important thing, and Jay's heard me say this, Louis heard me say this, great ideas get you great meetings. Comfortable and execution gets you funded. If you have a great idea, you have paper, and you want money to go from paper, you better have month by month Every single contingency showed out how you're going to make the game, who's going to be doing what, and it's a lot of work, but it's all paper. And I mean, they want to see, well, how many seats of Perforce? Where's your, 
Are you guys using Microsoft Offset, Office 365? Where's that license fee? Because all of it adds up. And they just want to see it to know that you thought it through. Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, you know, a little bit to counter, it's uh, uh, what a lot of people, a lot of publishers have agreed upon. I think it's important for developers to find out why you are special, and that's really what you have to prove. It's like you may not have, um, you know, if you just have, if you think you have an amazing design, that's definitely not enough. That's, um, but if you, if there's something special about your team, about the guys you've worked with, what you guys have done in the past, your history, then that's really going to be your selling point, and that's really what you need to highlight when you uh, when you c come to publishers, because that's really what we're going to be investing in. If if that truly is your value. Um, just a good idea is that is a good idea is not special. I guess that's what I want to say. But um, but there are many other things that are that are special, and it's your job as a developer to figure that out and to be able to pitch it uh, accurately. Shipping product is special. Very much that, so. That that is by far and away the most special thing you can tell me when you sit in my office and say, "I've got this great idea. I don't want to talk about your idea first. I want to know what you've done first. That that is the single biggest determiner for whether I'm interested in funding you or not. And that's a very good point too because you don't necessarily have to have shipped the greatest game, but if you can sit down in front of someone who you're talking to about giving you money and show that you even have shipped a game, you're ahead of about 90% of the people that are going to be standing in line. It's the ability to get that cross the finish line and get it out there and that you know if it wasn't successful, what did you learn from it? You know, what did you take away from it and how are you going to grow? It's important to understand the difference between a feature and a selling point. You know, if you're making an RTS and you have four different races you know, or armies, that's a feature. The unique selling point that your game and your company brings to the fact is that you have the designer, lead designer from XYZ, other existing game. Understand that make, what makes it unique versus what just makes it a feature. And, and one thing I would like to add to, uh, to that, I mean, people are afraid sometimes to talk about their previous games and say that they weren't that successful, that you didn't get all the KPIs you wanted, all the revenue you needed. Um, publishers know that. If you had made a game that made $100 million, you probably wouldn't be sitting in front of them requesting funding anyway. <laughs> But, but it's important to uh, live up to your, your shortcomings, where you made mistakes, what you learned from it, and how is it going to be different in your uh, upcoming games and upcoming uh, pitches. If not, I mean, you just look like you're putting your head in the sand and that you're just saying that everything's going to be all right every time, which it isn't. So you have to be show that you're prepared. This has very little to do with financing a game, but... Uh, uh, on Louis's point about learning from what happened previously, hugely important, uh, but a lot of developers will stumble at that stage because their their analysis, their post-mortem on what they did before and why it didn't work will often be, well, we didn't get enough publisher support or we didn't have enough marketing or UA spend. That That's not a good reason for why the product didn't work the way you wanted it to, why it didn't achieve the KPIs you thought it would. Uh, focus more on what the game was, the decisions you made, and how that ended in whatever the result was. That's a great story to tell a publisher. Simply saying, you just needed to give me more money uh, is not a solution. That's a really good point. I've had meetings turn around on that. Where they're like, well, we did this other game. Why did it get a 6 out of 10? We tried to implement this. It was way harder than we thought. And when we finally did it, it actually wasn't fun. And we found out that this thing over here was really fun. So for our next game, we're not going to bother with this. We're really going to focus on this because this is what the players like. So we're moving forward on that. They're like, oh, wait, so someone else paid you to learn that. So now I can pay you to go with the thing that's good. That, that's a great story to tell. Uh, that, that's a story I want to hear as a publisher's representative. Uh, and the more you can double down on that with examples, with data, uh, that – that just gets me more excited. I don't know. You're probably in the same boat, Jason. Yeah, uh, that's true. Like, and you have to realize, you know, with the nature of games, a lot of like at least a lot of us on um, on the panel here is, you know, we don't fund that many games. We fund a, a, a small handful of high budget big games. So and so we need to make um, a very selective decisions. 
So you know, it just because just as something sounds cool usually isn't enough, and um, basically there's a ton of risk factors. You no know, games are hard. It's games are really hard to make, and there's a ton of risk factors, and then you know we need to just be, make sure that those risk factors are uh, you know mitigated as much as possible, just to know it's a safe bet. And you know, a lot all of us have like huge approval gauntlets we gotta go through. You know, as as business as biz dev guys, we we're just guys to guys up front. But there's a whole corporate structure that we need to get this game passed. And if we can't convince our corporate management or executive leadership, then no. If you can't convince us, then we can't convince them, really. Okay, but also to, the, here, let's go back to, we kind of got off subject a little bit here. Sorry about that. That's my fault. Um, the pros and cons. So the pros of going with the traditional publisher, and correct me if I'm wrong, you get funding. A lot of times you get a lot of great experience. 90% of the time you get great experience and good input, you get testing. The cons are you lose a little bit of freedom. Sometimes you have to wait for approval processes. Some, a lot of, you have a lot, sometimes you have marketing people fly by or producers fly by or the VP of production look at the game for five minutes and go like, oh, it should be open world. And then walk around, walk away like it's an arena shooter. We're not making an open world game. So you get, kind of get into the cons of that. The pros are the publisher will market it. The con is normally don't make any money. Um, you don't make money on development, and it's really hard to make money on a royalty, but you build your resume, which hopefully leads you in to co-funding your next game. So if you can sit side by side with the publisher and co-fund the game, if you guys could talk about how that, that those deals kind of look when you when someone comes in, the budget's $2 million, the developer can put $1 million, or they show up with the prototype, they can put another million in, and they need another million and marketing. How does that work? What are the pros and cons of something like that? Yeah, the value of co-funding is um, the developer and the publisher have the, have the same skin in the game. You really, it's you know, it's not like the tr traditional model. The publisher takes pretty much all the risk. Yeah, there's opportunity cost risk from the developer, but the same for the publisher side. But the publisher takes all the risks. They pay for your salaries for the next year or whatever, how long, however long necessary to get the game done. But all all the risk is really on the publisher in the traditional model. For co-funding, um, if the developer is going to put in put in half the budget, we're essentially equal partners there, you know, and and we're both taking the same risks there, um, and you know, and you notice you you'd be surprised to see you know with that additional creative vision some of the values that the if the developer gets to speak their mind and can push more weight, a lot of times the game ends up being could be very successful in in that area, and the publisher. Their responsibility wouldn't be so much on controlling the development as much because obviously, if you can fund your game, you've done some stuff right. Um, but more um, fig figuring out how to how to get the game to market the best way, how to um, build the biggest buzz for the project, and, and pretty much fulfill our role as a publisher. You also, I mean, and we see a lot of developers come to us and tell us that they want a co-funding model. And the thing that you have to keep in mind is if you're going after a legitimate co-funding model. You have to actually prove that you've got your million dollars as well. It's not a matter of sitting going, well, we feel it's worth a $2 million project, and we only want you to put a million dollars in. You have to be able to show that you are putting your skin in the game. And the other point that goes along with what Jason said is you have to be very confident in your abilities and your studio and your vision for that game and you know, have the backbone to stand up and push back against that publisher. Otherwise, you're not going to be in a you know equal opportunity situation. They're only funding half of your game, but they're dictating all of the design choices and, and budget choices and all of that stuff. That's not the same. So you need to be able to sit there and hold your own with some very experienced people, not only on the financial side, but on the design and implementation side as well. Yeah, well said, uh, yeah. What, what are the deal? I'm, you know, I should have done this. If a publisher funds a game, let's just say it's an original IP, what does a royalty look like? I always, this is the question I get most, the, the biggest question I get asked from most people, <laughs> if the publisher funds my game, what is a reasonable royalty to expect? You're not going to see a dime. No, but what's a reasonable <laughs> royalty, assuming it's a hit, no one goes to not make a hit. But I mean, what's, what's a reasonable royalty to expect? We see it anywhere, and you know we've got a lot of different variation up here. 
geography and, and otherwise, but we see a variation from anywhere between 15 to 25, 30% on a escalating rate. It comes down to how much money they're putting into it. You know, the yeah. more they put in, the less you're going to get. Let's just say a full funded deal from a public publisher. Full funded deal, original IP, starting from scratch, PC console, uh, you're probably going to see something in the neighborhood of 30%. Uh, then depending on what you do above that, if, if you are highly talented, if you have a track record, you may be able to get some escalation in there based upon global revenue. But 70-30 is still the, the starting point for us at least. So that's the starting point. And of course, there's many factors that can adjust it, whether who owns the IP. The developer is the creator of, that, of the IP, but who actually owns it? That's a big factor there. Who's paying for middleware costs? If we're talking about Unreal Engine, that's... That's quite expensive there. You know, who's going to be paying for that? There's a lot of other factors that would adjust their percentages. One of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of developers make is they build their finance budget based on just what it's going to take to get it to the ship stage. They don't have anything figured in for live ops and you know ongoing content. And they have in the back of their mind this feeling that they're going to make their profit at the end of the day on the royalties. And so when I say you're not going to see a dime, that's not a knock at the publisher. That's just the mentality that you have to have and go in and have a little bit of cushion built into your budget just for business sake. So you're around to do another project. And one thing that's really important when you're doing a deal like this, always ask an example of the royalty statement. I always do that. <laughs> <laughs> you would be surprised how your math that you make in your head while you read the contract is not the same math that's going to happen for real. You think you're going to recoup and get rev share on the first two months when actually when you look at the real math, you're going to maybe see something month 14. Uh, you absolutely have to ask, ask questions. Don't feel like you're sounding weird because you don't understand exactly the math. It's important. There's UA cost in there. There's... That's a good on recoupable good fees, point. recoupable fees. Everything needs to be laid down on an Excel spreadsheet. You put it as an addendum to the contract. Everybody's on the same page. And that's really important. A lot of people are afraid. I want to see a royalty report. It's a really legitimate question. Um, I, I do a different thing too. I always say, okay, let's just put an Excel spreadsheet here. If someone spends $100 on Steam and my royalty is 30%, what gets taken out? Because I know 30% goes to Steam, so I'm starting already at seven. So I'm thinking I'm getting $2.10 for each unit sold on Steam. If I'm not, show me what else gets taken out. And different publishers do deals differently. Some take out marketing, some don't take out marketing. Some take out the, because you'll see some people that the royalty is 10%, and I'll look at the definition, and I'll be like, that 10% royalty is actually better than their 30% royalty. Net and the receipts easiest, is a very nebulous yeah, concept. The easiest, the easiest way to do that is have, have just take out an Excel spreadsheet and say, give me an example. And that's the easiest way to do it. If you're going to talk to a number of publishers, do your best to compare apples to apples on the money. Because we all, as, uh, as Jeff said, we all do our math a little bit differently. It, it's all there for you if you walk through it. We're not hiding the ball in any sense, but it, it certain publishers care about things in one context that others may not, and vice versa. And they define things differently. Yeah. Like adjusted gross is normally gross revenue, less platform fee, less taxes. So a 10% gross revenue def, uh, royalty can be higher than a 30% net revenue. So that's a really good example. Okay, so that's a royalty for a publisher-funded deal. What's a, which we kind of didn't answer. What's a royalty for a co-funded deal? If it's 30, let's just use a baseline. If it's 30% for a publisher funded deal, what's a royalty, what would be a same factor or factorial as we go co-funded? It would, um, the, because the developers putting their own cash in, it would be definitely more favorable for them. Um, and that's been like, you know, I, I think a starting point is probably 50-50, assuming that you guys are funding 50% of the, of the budget, that makes the most sense. Right, but it, it's not 50-50 of the same number is yes. the important point. A lot more gets taken yeah. out from top line revenue in at least the way we've looked at co-funding deals uh, because the, the theory is we have to share those costs. 
across the board as opposed to a cost that is normally borne by the publisher. For example, marketing, server cost, the community team, whether if you outsource QA, outsource CS, if you have sub-publishing in certain geographic regions, all of that gets stuffed into top-line revenue now. So while, yes, you're splitting things 50-50, you might actually end up with less money in a co-funding arrangement depending on what gets put into the definition. It's important to point out as well that you can, you can as the developer, end up with 60, 65, 70% if you're doing a lot of the things that you know some publishers can't do. I mean, we've done deals with publishers who are traditionally PC console publishers, but they have an opportunity to jump into the mobile market, but the developer has self-published titles in the mobile market, and they know a little more yeah. about how it's done. They can demand a little more of that revenue. Yeah, that's true. Um, the next thing we have, this is... Before we get on that, Jeff, just w one point. Is mobile is an entirely different platform than PC console. The, what the, the first parties do, the Apple and the Googles of the world, they do a lot of the things that a traditional publisher used to do. Uh, and so the publisher-developer relationship with mobile is quite different. And as a developer, you're going to want to think about whether the publisher is actually adding value out apart from simply here's some money. So all of our recent mobile deals, for example, would fall into that co-funding realm uh, in the sense of structure, even though we're putting up all of the money. So we put up the money out of the top line, you take out the platform fees, you take out marketing UA spend, uh, and you take out server costs, then we share the result of that 50-50. That's the starting point for our mobile deals. That does not work in the PC and console world. Um, yeah, and that's important, which is actually a great segue to our next one. If I'm a mobile developer, I completely funded my own game, why do I need a publisher? What's, what's the pro of going to a publisher at this point if I've completely funded my game? What, what, do, I, what do I get? Well, you have to look at what you have internally before and looking at what you'll need as a publisher. Do you have a relationship with Apple and Google? If you don't, you need a publisher. Do you have the ability to do UA? I mean, not I'm going to go buy ads on Facebook, but you have an ability to create 500 creatives for 20 different platforms and target them specifically for markets that have different KPIs around the world. If you don't I'm have sorry, that, what's, what's 500 creatives, what's that? Uh, so a, a lot of games that do a lot of advertising, they have upwards of 500 different ad creative, whether it's the size, the video, uh, what you portray on your ads. All this is to try to keep your cost of marketing as low as possible and keep it fresh. Uh, if you look at the top advertisers out there, the ads are always different. And there's a reason for that. They're trying to attack uh, users in a different way. So they need to have all those creatives. You need to have that ability to create those things. Um, so I think it's important to know what you can and cannot provide to your game and understand how deep you need to go for mobile game uh, publishing. Do you have PM? Do you have business intelligence internally? You're gonna need to evaluate your game on a per, per market, per demographic uh, basis. Can you do it? Do you need help on that? So. Self-publishing, a lot of people used to say in the uh, prime days of Apple and Google Play that you just turn on a switch and you're worldwide. Uh, yeah, you can do it, but today, if you don't have all those uh, different things, you're not going to make any money out of your game. You'll be surprised how little downloads you're going to get just by flipping on the switch. If you get 100 downloads a day, you're lucky, and you're, you cannot survive on 100 downloads a day on a free, free to play game. For uh, developer funding with... Uh with a partner publisher, you know, uh, we call it like those are called we call those licensing deals, and um, essentially because you know you, the developer has a game, and the marketing is really the the biggest driver there. If if you have your own marketing, if you can confidently do your own marketing, then you probably you may not need a publisher then because you've already made your game, you know, and have the ability to market it. Um, then in those cases, that's a lot of areas where you want to self publish it. Um, one general area is of course you know regional like. Um, uh, territories like you know China is a is a territory where you cannot publish your game. You need to work with a Chinese publisher due to government. That's the government restriction there. Um, Korea is another area where you probably should work with a Korean publisher. It's a uh, those. I agree. Are, yes. 
those regions are completely different. The way they do things are is, um, there's so many different platforms there that are not here in America. Everything you know about how you do how you publish games here is completely different in a lot of those regional territories, which are huge, huge markets. So working with a publisher, those so that's those are a lot of the big drivers for working with a publisher in those territories. Okay. Um, I never knew about the five hundred creators. Yeah, I never, I never really, I never really, I never really thought about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the next one is um, angel funding. Is anyone back? Is anyone VC back? Angel funded back or looking for that kind of funding in here? You should all be looking for that kind of funding. <laughs> you, you shouldn't expect. Yeah, you should take it. I don't think you always should take it, but yeah. you should be looking. You should also be buying lottery tickets. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I actually like angel. I mean, yeah, I, I, a lot of friends and family. That's a good way to get started, but. Friends and family is different. Friends and yeah. family, from a publisher standpoint, and maybe this is where the panel is going to get a little combative. Uh, yeah. We we disfavor publishing relationships when a VC is involved. We Ooh. we <laughs> we have done them, but we find that the priorities for a VC and the priorities for a publisher tend to conflict in ways that puts the developer in a really awkward situation. I have run into that multiple times, I'll let you mention it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's not an impossibility. Uh, we, we have some VC relationships that we've worked very well with because we have the same long-term vision for what those investments end up being. And make no mistake, when we fund your game, even if it's recuperable, it's still an investment. Uh, but if you were to come to me fresh and say, oh, by the way, we've already taken X million dollars in VC funding and I own 20% of my own company and we want you to fund our game. No, thank you. I'm good. Or I want to talk to the person who owns 80%. Yeah. Um, did someone ask something? I, I think based on that, we might want to skip right to self-publishing because if you do raise your own capital, you do raise your own capital, you're out there, you're ready to self-publish. What it? I mean, obviously the upside is you can do what you want. I mean, what are the things, the key things and the pros of self-publishing and what can people do to maximize their success if they self-publish? We've got the VC, the VCs agreed, hey guys, here's your money to make the game. Let's just say it's a small mobile game. Here's two to three million dollars. We're making a little mobile game. We're gonna get it out there. Um, if you guys take off, and we start to see some traction with user app. We start to see some good uh, KPIs. Here's five, we have five to seven million sitting here for user acquisition. So it's a little, not a big thing, just a nice. Yeah, so thing. I think what's important, you mentioned it, the user acquisition part. When you make a game and you're planning on self-publishing, always have in mind a minimum of one to one ratio. How much did it cost me to make my game? that money at the minimum will be spent in marketing in the first three months. So if you spent $2 million making your game, if you want to have a successful game, you're going to need to spend at least $2 million at in the first least. three months. So that's already there. You're doubling your cost. And, and it goes extremely fast. And Unless you get featured. Uh, then you want more. If, yeah, but featuring is not even that much powerful anymore. So um, I'll, I'll, g I'll give you some real life stories of this. Uh, we shipped a game this May, Beauty and the Beast Perfect Match with Disney. Just so happens, uh, we were trying to get featuring, trying to get as much love as we can. Four other Match 3 games shipped in the same month. All of a sudden, your plan, yeah, your Disney, you have the biggest movie license of the year. All of a sudden, Apple says, guys, I featured too many Match 3 games. I'll do a small featuring as a favor. And all of a sudden, all your numbers go down the drain, and then you have two options. Am I going to push and create those users through user acquisition, or I'm going to see what organics do and take the long road? But if you, if you go marathon versus sprint, your PNL is going to change entirely. And all of a sudden, you have to answer to that VC that you showed them a forecast of a million dollars of revenue month one. To do that, you needed the four million downloads, and you needed the, the featuring, and you don't have it. What do you do? So you need to have all those plans and you need to have a team of publishing that's going to be extremely strong and versatile to actually help you 
get those downloads back because if you don't get eye featuring the first week, you're not going to get it two weeks later, two months later, or two years later. Featuring is not a marketing plan. Do, do not bank on, well, we'll get featured and then success. This yeah. guy at Google loves me. That's my favorite. Yeah. It looks like Google my, loves everybody. My cousin's an engineer there. I'm yeah. good, yeah. No, yeah. Google loves everybody. Google's great. They love every day. It, it is for Google. I think for self-publishing, um, on mobile, it, it's tough. Mobile's very tough for self-publishing. It's um, If you're an indie, um, there's... There's, you know, outside of getting lucky, the, the three strategy I can really think of is basically the shotgun approach, just pump games out, generate little revenue from, uh, from small games, and, you know, little revenue added up ends up being a lot of revenue, which you can kind of work on, like, your bigger titles. But it really, there's not too great of a platform for, um, to support indies in mobile. On the PC console side, well, I guess on the PC side, um, Steam, you know, early access has really been a, a major mover for, for self-publishing, for indies to be able to actually get their game out. That was my next one. Yeah, the, the, the players are actually okay with really broken, uh, broken looking, poor graphics looking games. <laughs> and then they're, they're okay. They, they care about they're the They're okay factors. with games that don't work. Yes, <laughs> so long as you continually update. This is yeah. where we see a lot of early access games run into trouble. They put it out there and they say, we're in early access, expect bugs. And the community encounters the bugs and they report the bugs uh, and everyone's happy. That's day one. On day two, the community now expects you to be fixing those bugs, to be implementing new features. In other words, don't leave your game in early access for two years while you're raking in money, and then ultimately you're going to have this grand launch that's going to be special. If you go early access, you are a live game that's service really from point. day one, and you need to plan accordingly. People want to see updates. Go on, sorry. You will get in a lot of trouble, and I'm not going to name any names here, but if you stay in early access for two to three years and then start shipping downloadable content while you're still in early access and charging players for it, it doesn't <laughs> look good. And that is going to affect you one way or another. And you know, going back to the one-to-one -one marketing point, not only do you have to have that money ready and be ready to spend that, you need to understand where it needs to be spent. Because along the same lines as Apple and Google are going to feature me is not a marketing campaign. Shipping codes to your game to 2,000 streamers is not a marketing campaign. I mean, the streamers out there, especially the bigger ones, are getting dozens if not hundreds of requests to play their game a week. Which ties back into the you're not special. And a lot of them are demanding payment. Yes, they do, yes. And, and, and I, would also, uh, I would also uh, raise some warnings on, on Steam. Um, if you look at, at mobile, it, it suffered from being too popular, right? Six years ago, everybody was doing great, and everybody started shipping games, and now there's hundreds of thousands of games shipped every year, and that's creating the problem where it's difficult to get discovered, it's difficult to get downloads, featuring is not as powerful, marketing costs increase to the great pleasure of uh, the marketing firms out there. The problem with Steam is that <laughs> a lot of people that were in mobile couldn't make it anymore, so they said, I'm going to start making PC games because that's what I like. So guess what's going to happen to Steam in the next year and a half, two years? It's already happened. Already. Yeah, it's already happened, but it's going to get worse. So all of a sudden, you're going to have the same discoverability problem on Steam and just clicking on Switch won't work anymore, so you're going to have to increase marketing. So but what's the pro? What... Let's, let's, focus, let's, let's focus on, all right, if I am going to self-publish on Steam, what's the, pro, what, what, what's the problem? PR. I found, by the way, I found PR is one of your best things to try and bring up. Uh, yeah, there's several pros to self-publishing. One, you control everything, top to bottom. You get to execute on your game vision the exact way you want to. That doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be successful, but you get that entire vision realized. Uh, two, you can control where money gets spent and how, which is important. There uh, can be conflicts between how much money you want to pump into UA and how much money I want to pump into UA. Uh, you may believe that your game is on the verge of hitting that tipping point and is going to explode out if you could only get 
a thousand more users, 10,000 more users, you may want to invest in that. Your publisher may not see it that way. So control over all aspects of it is a major pro for, for self-publishing. The other major pro, and I think this is what Jeff was alluding to, is PR. There's a huge love of the indie community, the self-publishing community. You put your game out there and you say, hey, we are self-funded, self-publishing. There's a certain amount of love, respect, acceptance of some things that maybe aren't quite as polished, some things that don't work as well. The community will accept you to a greater degree than if you've taken publisher money, you have publisher resources. That's a good point. And you still put a game out there that may not be fully polished. Okay, we're getting flagged a little bit. Before we go too much further, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so a uh, very similar question, but on the desktop front, uh, I've been uh, talking with a publisher that approached me that's, uh, they're new, they don't have a, a huge track record, track record that I could just research. So I'm wondering, I'm um, adding to that, before anything is signed, what can I ask for to make a bit more educated decision and what is reasonable? Can I uh, ask for, like, of course, I wouldn't ask for exact numbers. Can I ask for kind of a, basic marketing outline, or is that kind of asking them to do their work before they stand on the deal? Uh, what can I do to kind of gouge whether that's a good deal? It's a, again, it's a self-funded game, that's and a they really, just want to do yeah. distribution and marketing. I get it. That's a really good, that's a good question. Yeah, he said he's looking at desk, a desktop game. He's funding it. He wants to know what he can ask for from the publisher that's reasonable. Hey, publisher, you're going to market it? I want, these are my questions. All those things that we talked about that the developer needs to have when they go to a publisher, you know, with the individuals who are involved, their track record, even outside of that development firm, all of those questions, you need to flip and go to them. If you're a relatively new publisher, who is on your team, what have they done, good or bad, you want to see that experience. I mean, you're not going to be able to go in there and demand financials on all of them and, and pin people down to a marketing you know, budget right off the bat. But there's a lot of stuff that you can do, very basic, looking on, you know, through the publisher, go to their LinkedIn pages, the individual's LinkedIn pages, Google them to see, you know, what other games that they've yeah. worked on. Well, he said they're new. He said they're, I'm sorry, they're a new publisher. They're, yeah, but the individuals, or the people that make up that new publisher <laughs> is what's going to be key. Yeah, I agree. I think the question I have for you is why are you looking for a publisher? Um, if you self-funded it, basically you must have certain things that you want from that publisher. Yeah. Find out who can this new publisher, can they provide those things? If they have, if you don't know, figure it out. Ask them. Go visit their office. Talk to them. See if they're hiring people that, you know, see if they have a strong UA staff. If that's, what, if that's one of your concerns. If they don't, then are they actively hiring for someone? If they're not, then, um, then are you, are you are you signing a publisher just for the sake of you know false promises? That's probably not a good reason to work with a publisher. You know, all of like, you know, like for example, Nexon and Perfect World. We both look at some. We both look at the same games. We both chase after the same projects, but we both provide di very different values and immense values for any developer. But it's very very different. So you want to make sure you f work with the right publisher that gives you exactly what you need for you, what you believe you need for your game. The reality of it is if you're creating a PC game that you're going to launch on Steam and all of those little platforms and you've self-funded, if you don't need user acquisition, like for a free-to-play game, and you don't need development funding to finish the game, you realistically don't need a publisher. You can figure yeah. it out. You can, you can do a lot of this stuff. If you have the money, he's right. And, and that's the key. You, you have to have the money. If you don't have the money, then yes, you're going to need. Or that you don't, and you have to have the people, and you have to have the people in Spain. You have to have the people in Estonia. You have to have the people in Italy. You have to have the people there. Oh, there's this event coming. We're going to do this co-marketing with such and such, and it's a lot France. more work. But yeah. it can be done. They, in other words, you have to be a publisher. I, I, I think to <laughs> to sum up what you can ask for, you can ask for their data package, their <laughs> platform core. Right? What are they going to offer your game? You can ask for, and this would be very important, ask for some of their financials, not digging into their P&L necessarily, but you're going to want to know that they've they got money. the money to support you as the publisher. If their funding dries up, does that mean you're screwed? 
so that, and this happens a lot with new publishers. With new absolutely. publishers, so they thought the other game was going to be a hit. Yeah, they, it, how leveraged are they? That that's a perfectly fine question. Uh, and then I would ask them about their relationships, right, with other companies that are in the space that they need to execute on what they're going to do. If you're looking to do a huge blowout at a trade show. Who have they worked with or who do they have a relationship with that can build you a booth, that can do event marketing, that can bring the influencers to you, that can do whatever it is in the plan? Uh, having the plan is one thing. Having the relationships to execute on the plan is quite another. Make them – this is – I'm sorry to jump in. Make them answer to. A lot of times when you do it, it seems to be common now. It's going to be a hugely success. Our marketing plan, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be the most amazing, hugely amazing, hugely thing you've ever seen. It's going to be amazing. Hugely. Bigly. Uh, bigly, bigly, bigly. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge. Everyone's going to see your game. No one's going to see an amazing yeah, marketing plan. Yeah, we're the best. And then you say, great, this amazingly, hugely thing. What, what's, what's the name of your vice president of marketing again? What's her name? You know, what, who's going to do this? Who's going to do – you have this hugely amazing PR plan. Great. What's the agency's name? Can I talk to them? And you just all of a sudden watch them go, oh, well, uh, 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 well we're going to hire them. Well, can I talk to your marketing person? I want to talk to her. You know, she's in charge of this. She's done all these wonderful worldwide things. I want to talk to her and see what she sees from my game. Uh, 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 the number of times I've had publishers like, well, we haven't hired that person yet. So you're going to have this marvelous campaign with this marvelous PR firm that you haven't identified run by this mar amazing marketing person that hasn't been hired or I haven't talked to. Demand, 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 demand to talk to that person. How, I'm, who does the marketing? Great. How many hours do you have allocated to me? You know, you're going to be doing this. I self-funded my game. I put my house up for mortgage. I want to know, and these are legitimate questions. Every, every week, what can I expect from you, the marketing person, to be spending hourly on my game? And the reason we keep pushing back on and, and emphasizing that you have to ask these questions is because we've all seen developers through the years that are afraid to ask these questions. You know, they don't want to be seen as pushy okay. or you know anything along those lines. But if you're going to be successful and you're going to create a successful partnership with this other company, you absolutely have to ask these questions. And if somebody pushes back and says, no, we don't want to answer it, there's your red flag. If they don't, and also too, if you demand to know how many hours, I've done this before. They'll write it, get it an email. We're going to spend 16 hours a, a week marketing your game. Then they don't. Hey, you know what? Give me the money. I'll hire a marketing person myself. I've done that a lot. It's like, you know what? You don't have the resources. That's okay. I, I can hire the resources. Do we have time for one more question? Yep, we'll do one more quick question. <laughs> Hi, just a quick question. Um, can you comment a little bit about the breakup process? Sort of the, we've done a lot of the courting and getting married process, but if you can talk, to, just comment broadly on the breakup and, don't, and what, don't do it. what you need to think about <laughs> before you start. Don't break up. It's hard. Yeah. No, sometimes you have to. Um, God, that's, I think we, I mean, that's a multi-headed hydra. It, it depends. Your, your marriage metaphor is apt because it is a divorce process and people are both emotional and financially drained at that point. Uh, it is never a good thing. You just try and navigate it the best you can. And if you're a developer, uh, I guess my advice would be get out as quickly as you can. Fighting might get you a little bit more money. But it's being get able out. to get out and then start marketing your game or your team to someone else quickly is the single best strategy for you to move on. And bitching on the internet about your publisher publicly is never going to turn out well. Never as nope. well. Because they will out pitch you. And one last, thing is, uh, <laughs> yeah, one last thing is for, for the breakup process. I also agree, don't do it. Because as soon as you break up, you know, the publishers, they all talk to each other. They know why. Yeah, you're, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause for the, uh, the panel, please. Thank what, you. What, what